he prays for a son. And I believe God just wanted to know where your heart was. He prays for a son. He waits for a son. He's faithful to God. God gives him a son. Then God sacrifices your son. My God, the one you promised me? You, you mean the one that I waited for these 25 plus years? The, you, that son. The one that you quickened my wife's womb for. The one that you gave us life to create life. <clears throat> and now you want me sacrifice the one son I've been waiting on. The promise. Sacrifice. Abraham goes. And God had to speak twice. Because Abraham was so committed to God that Abraham was about to do what every father probably wouldn't do to prove that God was the one that he truly worshipped. And I believe God was testing as, as, watch, has what you've been waiting on become object of your worship? God said, Abraham, Abraham, whoa, 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 listen. Hear that ram in the thicket? I provided your sacrifice. Watch this. This is my point. When you're willing to demonstrate or act in faith or move in faith to show God that the very thing that God's promised has never taken your heart away from God, you begin to know God. Okay. It was there that Abraham came to know him as Jehovah provider. Which means that, or what I ascertain from this is that the enemy will use the spell of idolatry to keep you from knowing the one and only through God. Help me, Holy Spirit. Notice when our hearts are turned away, it's not because we resent God. It's never that. It's many times it's because of what we long for. Like I long for a son. I long for a, a better situation to put my family. In. I long for it's 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 normally. It's the craving. This is, can I tell you what sits at the root of idolatry? Why, 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 how to break this particular spell? We're going to be challenged in areas in our life um, when it comes to, and, and maybe preferably this sets someone free, <clears throat> is that there are things that God wants to do in your life, but he knows that if he does that, he'll lose you. And watch this, because he's such a good father and he knows that you can't live without him, he doesn't give that to you. Because if he blessed you for what you were asking him for, it would take you further away from him and from up under his cover and up under his, his, his the, the grace that's operating in your life right now. So God has to withhold the one thing he longs to do for you because he understands that the, the, you long for it so much, you crave for so much, Satan will pollute your desire. Okay, watch this. Go to Colossians 3. Colossians 3. Look at verse 5. <laughs> Look what it says. Somebody say, therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and what? Covetousness. Which is, now, the word covetousness there, it derives from a word that is numerically more. 
and the two words, numerically more and have. Probably the desire for more things. Lusting for a greater number of temporal things that go beyond what God determines is eternally best or according to his will. Covetousness. It's aggression. It's desire. It means desire for advantage. When anything on this earth becomes so great to you and needed and diverts your mind and your heart from the guiding voice of the Holy Spirit, it runs the risk of becoming your object of worship. Covetous. Now, have you noticed that all too often the biggest idol in our life is the one that we look at in the mirror. <clears throat> Just, and I'm not into conspiracy theories, right? But think about this. Well, thank you, Holy Ghost. <clears throat> Jesus refers to Lucifer, to Satan, as the God of this world. The word world there translates cosmos. It means present day arrangement or structured, ordered system. Now, <clears throat> I've taught this before, maybe at some point again when we go into spiritual warfare. Paul said, we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but against prince of power, spiritual wickedness, and rulers in high places. And when you break all that down, you'll find out that the kingdom of darkness has a very structured, ordered system that Jesus said, um, the God of this world is coming, but he has nothing Right, meaning I'm not of his system. It's what he was trying to say to us when, he, when, the right, when John writes and says to be in the world, right, but don't be of its system. M- many of the strongholds that we're wrestling with in life are really what comes from, it's the product of that system. Satan creates a way of thinking. And when we become captivated to that way of thinking, and he's very clever, that's why we need the Holy Spirit in discernment will pollute something that's good. There's nothing wrong to having a longing for something. But have you know, if you're not careful, that longing will never be satisfied. And if that longing is what's used to turn your heart away from the one that should have your affection, it now run, you run the risk of falling into idolatry. So he has a system, a present day arrangement. Now, have you noticed this? <clears throat> what is real popular? What? What, <laughs> what do we find ourselves doing the majority of the day on some type of social platform? S- say it with me. Selfies. Selfies. Taking just, uh, that's, watch this. Have you noticed too? You share stuff with people that before you had it, like who really cares that me and my wife are eating dinner? <clears throat> dinner with the wifey. Like, you know, watch this. Just bought her a new ring. Bam. Selfie. Look at me in my new outfit. Selfie. Me and my crew. Selfie. Oh, I got a new dress. Got a new purse. Got a new bag. Got this. What you don't understand is if you're not careful, you'll find yourself feeding something. Because now you're doing it, but you're also looking for some kind of gratification, satisfaction. You went back. Don't, don't act like I'm the only one. If you're not careful, you go back to see how many people liked your message. <clears throat> I thought that was a pretty dope saying. Ain't nobody going to like it? But you liked his. Y'all go to kingdom life. You don't go over there. You like his message. <laughs> Watch this. This is my point. Somebody say system. system. You got to be careful of a system, man, because the system is designed to feed what uh, you're insecure about. You're insecure in certain areas. He knows that you, 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 you are, um, you know, you're not comfortable in that situation. He knows that you, you, you have a problem with how you look. He knows that you don't, you know, your social, social economic status is not where he knows. And so if he can get you so caught up into what you need more, of to make yourself feel better. My God. 
He can slide you into the practice of idolatry. More. I need more. I need uh, uh, God. You know, what? so now your prayers. Watch how you move into an unknown God kind of a thing because you know him. So that you wouldn't be coming to me about this because I could care less what they think about you. You would come to me and pray my will, not your will be done. The kind of prayers you're offering to me is because you're insecure in that area of your life and you want me to do for you so they can feel better about you. I know y'all weren't ready for that one this morning. So you're asking me again to do what? You, oh, you want, oh, God, you know, bless me indeed, enlarge territory so I can post it and let them know that you with me too. You, they ain't the only one you blessing to the unknown God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So now I'm in the midst, and the truth is I can't really be woke for my assignment to preach a gospel to the world because I'm actually captivated and caught in a system myself. It's a spell. I don't even realize it. Now it ain't the Holy Ghost driving me anymore. It's my own that are driving me. It's the person I'm in competition with on social platforms that's driving me. I mean, they're doing the same thing that I do. They took the idea I had. Isn't it crazy? You don't even do it, but now you feel like, oh, but I got to do it because that's what the new move. That's a new thing. I got to. Now, once again, I'm not saying that things can't be used in a positive manner. Churches have social sites, right, to present and to share stuff. But what I'm saying is guard your heart because Satan doesn't care who you worship, just not God. Because he wants to stand before God and accuse you day and night. I told you they won't worship you. I mean, that was the whole thing with Job. Take away everything he has, he'll curse you to your face. He ain't serving you because of you. He's serving you because of what he worships. What he possesses. What he has. And this is the question. If God took away the things you long for, would your worship change? Now, this is the test to show us what's, what kind of spell we under. Because if you find yourself leaving church because of what God didn't do for you. Done. So then who were you worshiping? What were you worshiping? Well, I thought you was going to do this and I asked you to do that. And I asked you. I asked you, and I asked you, and he didn't do it. And I was trusting God. So, wait a minute, they left your life, and where was your heart attached to, them or him? Because if he's the object of my worship, Come on. No matter. he'll satisfy my hunger. Come on. He satisfied, wait, 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 wait. He's, he's the bread of life. He's living water. Y'all ain't hearing me. Oh, I'm hungry. And I'm thirsty. Remember we taught that message? Uh, hungry men and thirsty women. Y'all remember that? <laughs> we, we, the only one that can satisfy your hunger is the unknown God. You see what I'm talking about in a minute? Only, the only one that can satisfy your thirst is the unknown God who is not unknowable. <clears throat> who chooses to reveal himself, but it'll never be found in the things that you've misplaced or put in the place of him. Look, now this is, I find this to be interesting. Um, go, go back to Acts really quick. I looked at when Paul came on the scene to preach to them, the scripture says something prior, uh, in verse 18. He says, it said, then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him. I believe they made up the cultural climate or, of, of, of what was happening in Athens because the Epicureans, they were all about indulgence. 
Their, their chief goal in life was pleasure. When you research them, you find out they believe that man was just another animal that returns to dust after the afterlife. So eat, drink, be merry, and just do you and just live it up. Indulge. You know what indulge means? Indulge means yield to satisfy or to gratify desires and feelings. It means yield to your desires, yield to it, to indulge in your appetite, to yield to the wishes and the whims. Be permissive with it. So that was one philosophical frame of thought in the area. That's what they taught. That's how they debated. So if you did history, you'll find out the Romans at the time, and they were very lewd and perverse people, very immoral. I mean, very, you know, very immoral, sexually immoral, practice bestiality. Like, they, that's what when one writes and says, so God gave them over, right? They left their natural affections. Because anytime that you're driven by indulgence, you'll find out that there is nothing, there is no other thing that will satisfy the thing you long for other than God. So that's the frame of thought there. And then there was the Stoics. Now, the Stoics, they were all about indifference. Watch how Satan is just crafted through a system. He's created this same culture again. We're in a culture that's about indulgence or indifference. Look around. Now, indifference is, watch this, it's to have little or no concern. Unimportance. Mediocre quality, the apathy, insensitive. We're in a time now that you could watch. In mo- I couldn't, but in most cases, we got people in the world now that will watch an old lady be mugged and beat up by young teens and not get involved, and walk by like it ain't nothing. Just it ain't none of my business. I'm on my way to indulge. I gotta go. He's created a culture. Watch this, that is bound by idolatry because it's hard. See, it's easy for you to tell me no, but it's hard for you to tell you no. This why, that's why this gospel, this, this, this culture is prime for the gospel. I said, I least it's prime for the gospel of Jesus Christ because the gospel of Jesus Christ will deliver you from your idolatry. It'll teach you that there's one king. One savior. One way he's the truth and life. He is the bread of life. I love how Jesus comes on the scene. I am the bread of life. Remember in John 6, he tells the people, he exposes their idolatry. He says to them, y'all didn't come to me because of the miracles. You came to me because you ate and you were full. Now think about this. Jesus tells them, y'all are not showing up because of the miracles I worked. You're showing up because I fed your flesh. You were hungry. It wasn't even about the things I did spiritually. It was about your flesh. So he says, I'm really going to test y'all. Unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you can't follow me. What? Because when you're carnal, all you think about is carnal things. So they said, this guy want us to be cannibals? We're out. He said, the disciples said, well, Jesus, we still with you. He said, man, look, I chose y'all and one of y'all is a devil. Don't get all excited about it. Like you're doing me a favor. (laughs) Indulgence, indifference. This is what we're in right now. This is really why we're broken so much, because the things we put our trust in constantly let us down. And we have done an injustice to it and them because they don't have the power to satisfy. Listen, can I say something, couples? Stop worshiping your spouses. I'm going to help you out. Stop looking for them to be something they cannot be. I'm going to say it. Stop. Look, look. They complete me. Wrong. You messed up from the beginning. You should have been complete before you started or been on the path to completion. Was she my real? Adam was complete. Well, when he took her out, he was incomplete. No, because God was what made him whole. God just said, let me a real. He didn't say, short one. Let me, let me a real.
What I'm saying is that whenever you make an idol out of something, some of us are made out of our children. Now you're telling your children, hey, this, this, and you, you worship them and they can't make, they have no room for error at all. And the, the first time they make an error or a mistake, you make them feel like they, they completely f- failed. The pressure to satisfy your desire. Like, man, that had to get to me. Like God said, man, you just, I understand, but don't let your desire should not become their desire. And you're looking for them to make you feel like you was a good father. You're going to miss it every time. Because when your idol fails, you feel like your idol failed you. Okay, I'll talk about it again. Oh, so, so since he failed you or she failed you, you feel like God failed you. Come on, you ever done that? God, how come you let that happen? Wait a minute, God didn't walk out on you, he did. God, why you let that happen? God didn't leave you, she did. So, you see, you see what I'm saying, the mindset? That's the idol, that's worship. You thought God was good because they stayed in place. The moment they move, God ain't good no more. So they move, you move. And God is saying, wait a minute, I'm confused. Wait, 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 wait. They were not me. They were not me. I never leave you nor forsake you. If you got it, you would be satisfied in whole. You realize, well, you missing out, not me. I know who completes me. But let me help you out. God taught me this. When I know this truth, I'll treat her better. Because I'm not acting out of my void. I'm not fathering out of my own hurt. My God, my God. God. Y'all with me? Yes, sir. To the unknown God. God is like, know me. I'm your rock. I'm your shelter. I'm your strong tower. I should be the lover of your soul. That's the flesh. That's temporal. That fades away. But I don't change. I love it. God don't get old. <laughs> he just, yeah, you just find out more about God. He's the same yesterday and forever, don't you? He's unchanging. So this is what Paul does. After he deals with the church and he deals with, he realizes, recognizes the environment and the culture he's in. Man, indulgence, indifference. He says, okay, I know how I'm going to do with this. I'm going to address four things. Now watch this. And we're going to close. And this is the four things you, you, you got to see and mark in your life so that you don't misplace. Thank you, Holy Good Spirit. Listen, our families would work better if we didn't idolize what was in the family. If we didn't put that unnecessary pressure, we could grow freely. We, we, we would develop more. We would grow more because God would stay at the center. He would be the object of everybody's worship. That way people could overcome their errors. People could grow past their, 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 their hurts and their pains because we realize that God is the source that fixes all things. We start teaching our kids, hey, no, 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 daddy, daddy's not, watch this, daddy's not the provider, daddy's a visionary. Our provider is God. God is our provider. So when dad come to dad and dad don't got it, you don't go, man, God, feel. no, 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 you start in prayer. You go to prayer, God, I realize that my dad is not a provider, but you are. I'm going to stand with him in prayer <clears throat> so that you can do what our family needs. I know how you listen. There are good men in prison right now because they didn't want their kids to see them as failures. They were upholding an image they could not uphold. And now the kids are upset with them because their daddy's in prison. They're upset with God. God, how come you let this happen to my family? Now my daddy's in jail just trying to provide for us. You see how we missed it? God says, wait a minute, you, you didn't know me. Your, your dad, your dad, I was the provider. Your dad wasn't the provider. You see how we're under this, we're in a system that has produced so many strongholds that keeps us so bound as a people. So relationships are failing because idolatry is increasing. Divorce is up because idolatry is on the rise. Oh, yeah, we, I, you idolize your flesh, yourself, indulgence, certain addictions, because we're trying to satisfy a longing. Now we find ourselves worshiping the very things that should be, we should be subduing. Right. Right. Wow. 
So four things. Look at the text. Paul says, he says, for I was passing through considering the objects of your worship. And I even found the altar with the scripture says to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you. God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth does not dwell in temples made with hands. Now, this is my point. What Paul begins to do is he says, first of all, let me address the greatness of God. Because you're going to see that your idols pale in comparison. He declared that this unknown God made the world and all the things in it. He is the creator. Every thoughtful person asks, watch this. If you think about it, everybody wants to know, where did I come from? Why am I here? And where am I going? Science attempts to answer the first question. Philosophy wrestles with the second question. But only the unknown God has the answer to satisfy all three questions. Paul says, man, look, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God made the world and everything in it. He is the Lord over everything that he's made. He is not a distant God, divorced from his creation, nor is he an imprisoned God. Locked in creation. You see what he's saying? He's like, look, he said to them, he said, man, God doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. You guys got all these idols and you can't. He's not imprisoned to what you, 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 what you created. He's far above all of it. He created what you're in. My God. Now, can you imagine what this starts to do with their minds? Because they're so stuck trying to satisfy their own cravings and their own desires. And truthfully, they know they made their God. How you going? You really talking to a God you made. And really expected the answer. That's crazy. <laughs> so God isn't distant. He's too great to be a housed in man made uh, in prison God. He's not even limited to your temples, to your buildings. I just got to get to the church because God is there unknown God you can drop to your knees and pray where you are you ain't got to get to that object it's not an object can't be confined by it when we say amen when you walk out God is walking with you (laughs) I told everybody look you said hello in here and say bye out there he's like oh where we're going I'm not restricted. Listen, let me tell you how we think. We think. That's why we do stuff that we think we're doing it in the dark. <laughs> well, I'm just not going to go back to the church till I get my life together. God was like, well, okay, so whenever you, we get your life together, we'll go back to church together. Because we think God is confined to things that are made with hands. Unknown God. So here we are, people of God, and we're acting like we don't know him. God, look, you in the club, he there with you. Before you turn up, he with you. David said, if I make my bed in hell, if I ascend to the ice of the heaven, you're there. The depths of the sea, you're there. Unknown God. I remember I used to tell, I used to before, and this is, I I had a pass because I wasn't saved. On Sundays, you know, we ride by the church, and if we was getting high before we got to the corner, we said, man, put that way, put it down. We're going to ride by the church. <laughs> so we cut our music down, ride by the church, put the, put the blunt down, cut the music, ride by the church. Then after we get past the church, turn it back up. <laughs> but the sad part is, at least in our un- ignorance, we have more reverence than people have now. Because now, people will come in church high. People will come, and I ain't talking about to be delivered. Uh, <laughs> it's a difference. You can come as you are. You can come high as long as you can be delivered. You come get Jesus, man, I'll get to just, just as you are. But we don't have the, this indulgence and indifference. We're either indifferent about things and really don't care about it anymore, or either we indulge to the point where we're so lost and trapped in what we're indulging in. And it's because we don't understand the greatness of God. 
So Paul said, let me help y'all out in your idolatry. God is too big. He's too great. He's not confined. He is, uh, this is the God. He, in other words, he's making known the unknown God that will make you put down all your other gods. The next thing, he tells them about the goodness of God. He goes on to say this, nor is he worshiped with man's hands as though he needed anything since he gives to all life, breath and all things. So after introducing the unknown God to Athenians, Paul continues to tell them about him. God is not served by human hands as though he needed anything since he gives to all people life and breath. He is, in other words, he's our provider. People may sometimes pride themselves in serving God, but it's really God who serves us. I know that sounds kind of crazy from what we're saying, but what I'm trying to tell you is you couldn't serve him if he didn't serve you. Okay. All right. I'll see if I can make it plain. Um, if think about this, if God is God, then he is self-sufficient and is in need of nothing. Not only do watch this, the church or the temples not contain God, but the service in the temples do not add anything to God. Like like what we do for God doesn't make him any bigger, doesn't take doesn't subtract as foolish as we can do at times. It doesn't take anything away from God. God is still, he's still God. Watch this. It is God who gives to us what we need. God is not dependent on man's offerings for his being because he is the greatest giver. That's why he gives seed to the. So if you're giving, God's saying you're only giving what I gave you. When you get this, you'll understand the tithe. God said, I gave you 100. Just give me 10. You're thinking, man, I can't give you what I work hard for. God said, wait a minute, I gave you the job. Okay, I gave you the arms to use on your job. Okay, I gave you the feet to walk to the job. Wait a minute, I gave you the mind to think about your job. Wait, you ain't giving me nothing that I didn't already give you. <laughs> so Paul goes into the goodness of God. He says... This is, he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. Our lives must be viewed as a gift from above. And watch this, and every breath we breathe is courtesy of God. You do know that, right? Take a breath. Say thank you, God. <laughs> every breath you breathe is courtesy. I know, but see, we're at a time now that you think you live on your own. Isn't that crazy how idolatry will do that? It'll get you to think that you're God. So you can plan your own way, do your own thing, Act like you want to act, and then all of a sudden, if the body don't work, you go, well, wait a minute, what, what, what's wrong? God will say, well, wait, you fix it. No, then you realize real quick who God, right? Everything we need and receive is a divine gift. Matter of fact, the Bible says every good thing given, every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. The time we have on earth is a gift from God. The energy, our mobility we have that enables us to get up and go to work in the morning or to assemble here to worship is a gift from God. The talent or the skill we have by which we earn our income is a gift from God. The combination of all these things, our productivity and all of our accomplishments are gifts from God. So Paul goes into it. Think about this. Our purpose in life is a gift from God. What would life be without purpose? None of us came into this world when we chose. Did you say, I want to come at this time? And because we chose, but watch this, but because God had a purpose in mind for us, that's why you can never get so discouraged when you wake up and feel like, I feel like my life has no purpose. If you're here, it's proof that you have purpose because you didn't send yourself here. You didn't equip yourself to be here. God sent you here. God gave you the purpose. God gave you the gifts. So you got to get before the giver so you can find out how you should be using it. Watch this. So now is our purpose in life to give our families, our parents, our grandparents, a good husband, a good wife, lovely children. They're all gifts from God. Matter of fact, Psalms 127.3 says, behold, children are a gift of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. The house you live in, give, covers you, keeps you warm, right, at night. 
Friends that you have, gifts. Just our gifts. Everything is a gift from God. So why are you worshiping the gift? If you're smart, you just worship the giver. This breaks idolatry because you realize, hey, I'm not going to put too much pressure on you because you're not God. So I can't expect for you to be doing what God does. And if you do fail, according to your word, I realize you're just as frail as I am. I'm sorry, I shouldn't even put that much pressure on you anyway. <laughs> the next thing, just about done, is the government of God. Paul announced, he says, he made from one every man, nation, under mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined the appointed times and the boundaries of their habitations. That's verse 26. In other words, God is the ruler. The gods of the Greek here, they, they, all this idol worship they were doing, they were distant beings who had no concern for the problems or needs of men. But the God of creation is also the God of history and geography. He is the Lord of heaven and earth. Do you see that? Right. So he, he is he is the ruler. He is king. He, 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 he is his dominion. His is his authority. Who are you searching for? Who are you searching for? Why are you searching? Why are you searching for God in stuff in this? Only the only things that God can provide for. So in Paul's message of the unknown God, it's about the majesty of the sovereign God. Matter of fact, one writer says, but this is knowledge which Christians today largely lack. I'm talking about the sovereignty of God. And that is one reason why our faith is so feeble and our worship is so flaky. We are modern men and modern women, though they choose, watch this, great thoughts of man have as a rule, a rule small thoughts of God. So we got to a place where we think great thoughts of man, but small thoughts of God. He says that when the man in the church, let alone the man on the street, uses the word God, the thought in his mind is really of divine majesty. Matter of fact, most of our thoughts are limited to what we were asking for. That's why if he doesn't do what we thought, we, the thought of God's love for us diminishes. The last thing Paul goes into is he goes into the grace of God. So we have the sovereignty of God, and then there's the grace of God. And this is why I want to close with this. In this verse here, look at verse uh, look at verse 30. Verse 29, rather, he says, therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature of God is like gold or silver or stone, shaping into something by art of man's devising. Truly, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man who he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. What man is he talking about? Jesus, Jesus. So in other words, God demonstrates his grace in that, in the fact that there is a man who will judge in righteousness the one that God has appointed, and this man is the one that he's raised from the dead. In his grace in this for centuries, God was patient with people's sins and ignorance. This does not mean that people were not guilty, but only God held back his divine wrath. But Paul here uses the same similar statement in a sermon at Lystra in Acts 14. He says, therefore, God, when, when God spoke, uh, he said, therefore, he spoke of God who in the generations gone by permitted all nations to go their own ways. So in due time, though God sent a savior and now he commands all men to repent of their foolish ways. The grace of God was wholly manifested in Jesus' sacrificial death on the cross. So as in the words of Isaiah 53 and 5, but he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities and the chastisement of our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging or his stripes, we are what? Right. So in other words, this is the reason that I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because in the midst of everything we're going through, God at an appointed time knew we would be where we are. This is why I have not lost hope right now. In all of our indulgence, in all of our 
indifference. As crazy as the world looks, as much idolatry that's taken place in the world, I haven't lost hope. You want to know why? Because of the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power of God. The word power there means dunamis. It's God's inherent ability to do what? To save, to deliver, to set free. What I'm trying to tell you is that the gospel, if you receive Jesus Christ already, that same gospel, that same power still abides today. If your heart is captive and caught into something, if you had put all your trust into someone or something and it's broken or they left, you don't have to walk around feeling like your life is ruined. It is not because they were not your savior anyway. Matter of fact, that it might have been moved by God because you put misplaced your trust in it. And God wants you today to turn back to him and get your feet on solid ground. My God, my God. It's the power of God unto salvation. And so today, the unknowable God longs to make himself known to you. Why be insecure when I provide your security? You know, that's the gospel message. Why feel empty when I feel? Matter of fact, to the point where your cup runneth over. Why are you still lost when I feel? How can you still be lost when I found you? There's not a place that I'm not, says the Lord. What I love about God, you can be in your little corner. You can be in this church and still feel all alone. And God's saying, hey, you're not alone. I'm not distant. See, that's what messed up the Greeks is because when Paul started talking, they said, hey, you got to tell us more about this. Because all these other guys are deaf and dumb. They don't talk. They don't speak back. Matter of fact, I made them the other day. <laughs> I was just being religious. Uh-oh. You know, that's religion right i love everybody that ain't into religion well if you're practicing something without relationship if what you're practicing ain't talking back is religion if what you're talking to is not talking back to you and i'm not talking about god and you hearing his voice what i'm saying is that if it religion is when you're practicing something without relationship so you can be in a non-religious church and still be practicing religion if you found yourself here and you really ain't looking to transform you're practicing religion If you're going through motions, you're practicing religion. If you have God and you know he's there, but you're still praying to someone else, you're practicing religion. Meaning he's on your shelf, but I'm going to run to him or her because I think they can give me a better answer. So then why is he on your shelf? If you're toting your Bible around and you're not reading it, you're practicing religion. I'm just saying, can I dispel all this stuff about I ain't religious? No, all of us do some religious stuff sometimes. If you say he's your God, but you don't talk to him, you're practicing religion. Think about it. If he's my God, if he's the God that I read about and I talk to him, I should talk to him. I should listen to him. I should seek his face. If he, if all things are possible through God, if he's sovereign, if he's great, if he's not distant, if he wants to be actively involved in my life. If everything I have is a gift from him, let me drop these idols. Some of us should apologize to the people that we badmouth because we they let us down. They probably went crazy because they were trying to be a god to too many people. Because instead of them telling you, please, whatever you do, don't worship me. Because I, I have the same, str- I have struggles in my head too. I'm trying to shake off the same thing that you're trying to shake off. I had to pray this morning like you were supposed to pray this morning. God wants to make himself known again to his people. I'm not talking about what we read. I'm talking about the experience. Stand to your feet.